Welcome back to Tech Radar. I'm Matt Phillips. I am John McCann. And we have sat down at the end of 2019, on our way into 2020, to reminisce about the last decade of tech and some of the stuff that came out this decade that didn't quite take off in the way we thought it would. Absolutely. I mean, we've had some great tech this year. Yeah. And some tech which could, maybe should have been great, but didn't quite make it. Happen, man. Didn't quite make it. So do you want to kick us off then with the first one on your list? Yeah, sure. And I think, and I know we're not in a competition, but at the same time, I think I've already got the winner. Well, now you've mentioned it, they're going to be in the comments saying uh, I mean, who won gonna, the competition. They're going to agree with me. Uh, kick it off. 3D TV. My word. 2010. TV company certainly suddenly went, holy crap, let's do 3D channels. You know, yeah. let's, let's offer this 3D content to people and 3D TVs are coming out and they're starting to get a bit more affordable and everyone's going to have one and everyone's going to get go home and stick on a pair of crappy 3D glasses <laughs> and watch their 3D content and it's going to revolutionise the living room. But even by 2013, it was already seen as a fad. 100%. Sales of 3D TVs were starting to dip. Uh, big uh, broadcasting companies like Fox and Sky were starting to move away from their 3D platforms. Yeah, and I remember them putting a lot of effort into it. Like that there was, the I think there was the Six Nations one year, you could go to the cinema and watch it mm. on Sky Sports 3D. And like, they were trying to get people in that way. So many movies were coming out in those couple of years that were 3D and really pushing that real D 3D stuff. And it just didn't, just didn't happen. I guess people don't want to sit at home and, and throw on some glasses, right? I guess that was the major. I mean, yeah, it, absolutely. It's just weird sitting at home, having everyone having to have a pair. So it was, yeah. it was costly, it was awkward. Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing about why this is the biggest fail is the amount that it was pushed by the industry. Like I went to CES in 2013. It was all about 3D 3Ds. Yeah. And yeah. Even then it was starting to slightly wane, but everyone was like, look at this new 3D TV, it's gonna be amazing. And it's just, yeah, it just didn't happen. And it was just a huge push, all the money poured into the marketing, how various analysts were saying, you know, this is the future of TV. Yeah. This is how we're gonna be watching for the next 10, 15 years. Yeah. And it just, you now can't buy a 3D TV, and that's crazy. And you know, and then they almost got the 3DS and stuff like that, just tried to do it without the glasses, but it never quite worked very well at all, really. It never took off. So yeah, I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think that's a, that's a solid pick in at number one. So along similar lines, glasses on your face, yep. smart glasses. Yeah. 2010, Google Glass was announced, and I thought, here we go. This is it, this is the future. This is like back to the future style tech right now. And again, just didn't take off. A lot of people found Google Glass kind of creepy, the idea that you could film people without them necessarily knowing. You know, they were banned from movie theaters and bars and clubs and all sorts of things because they were just kind of creepy and we weren't ready for them. The technology just wasn't there. And now, even this year, Amazon have announced they're doing some smart glasses that are style of a substance. You can pretty much just receive text messages, look at the weather, really limited Alexa sort of capabilities on them and no camera, no way to take phone calls. So they're just totally naff really and, and just not taking off in the same way. Sure, smart glasses as a whole, big duck, didn't really happen. I think it's a little unfair maybe to pin it on Google Glass. Oh no, 100%. Uh, it didn't take off, but at the same time, it wasn't meant to take off. It was a limited rollout to certain sectors. Sure. Um, and yeah, the, the product itself was very much first gen, it wasn't perfect, it wasn't ready for the mainstream, and sure. people haven't seen followed it up with anything. Well, that's it, and that's what kind of surprises me. I would have thought if anybody's gonna nail it, it's gonna be Google, maybe not first time round, but I would have thought by now, 10 years down the line, we'd be on Google Glass 4 or 5 yeah. by now, you know, and, and it would be a more ubiquitous thing. They would be stylish, you'd be able to pick different frames and prescriptions and that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, I guess it just hasn't taken off in the same way kind of, you know, smartwatches have and, and have kind of filled that space of being quick and easy to look at notifications and interact with your phone in that way. I guess the, the only maybe slight silver lining on the cloud of smart glass despair is Snapchat spectacles. And even then, you can't really call them a win because Snapchat really struggled to sell them. They were crazy expensive, yeah. but they were suddenly far more acceptable to have. Yes. Uh, it was a couple of years down the line. People had slightly got used to wearing something and then having it linked to one of the hottest apps of the moment. 100%. Uh, helped. Also, when you were recording, there was a visible spinning LED on the yeah. front so people yeah. know that you were recording. So that 
negated some of the peer, fears people had, but obviously you can still go around and just recording people, which is still weird. But at the same time, if you're just holding your phone in your hand these days, I could be recording you or sure. I could be looking at a text. Like, yeah. And people's fear about being recorded seasonally is, is, is kind of wonky in some cases. In yes. some cases, it's absolutely spot on. Um, so it, it's a funny one and yeah, Snapchat Specs, but they keep releasing new versions of Snapchat Specs. I mean, they're just really new designs. They don't yes. do much more. They've got a little bit more back to life, a little bit more storage. And maybe this time next decade, you know, the end of the next decade, we will all be wearing smart glasses, but I don't I mean, see it happening. I mean, smart contact lenses. That's what the movies mm. tell us, right? That's what you want. You don't want to wear very glasses. You just want to pop a little sort of Mission Impossible contact lens in. But then to people who don't wear contact lenses already, the idea of wearing contact lenses is, well, maybe it's just me. It's kind of creepy and I'd oh, like, no, I don't want to touch my eye and like, ah, no, no I don't want to do it. If I put a computer on it, maybe I can get over that mm, Maybe, 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 <laughs> maybe. So what's your next pick? So, smart glasses, great shout. Uh, my next pick is uh, slightly of an odd one, but it's mobile operating systems that aren't Android or iOS. The decade, that we're just coming to the end to, has seen loads of new OSs come to market, but only to survive the sure. decade. Android and Apple's iOS, everyone knows them. You either got an iPhone or you've got an Android phone, yep. and those are the two platforms. Yep. Um, some of them, Sailfish OS, Ubuntu OS, Firefox OS, you know, Minnows, they came along, we saw, we, we, I got, I personally got hands on with all of these and you abuse them and you're like, it's nice to have alternatives, but yeah. they didn't have the apps, they didn't have the UI finesse, it was just like, you've tried, but it doesn't feel whole. But then you've got the two big players, the biggest player of which was Microsoft, yeah. Windows Phone. Now, that, you can argue, absolutely didn't have the apps either. Apps yeah. was a huge crippling point for you, but, that was a fully fledged OS. It was on available on multiple devices. Okay, almost all Nokia Lumia devices, yeah. but there were some. There were a couple of Samsungs and a few others out there. And it was it was a proper OS. It had an ecosystem. Yeah. It had an interesting UI with Android and iOS getting more and more similar. Windows Phone was that point of differentiation. Can't even say. It. Windows Phone was different, <laughs> right? And also, um, you know, it worked well on lower powered phones as well. Absolutely. Like it had that optimization that I think, you know, only a brand like Microsoft Windows sort of can put the effort in to make sure those people aren't left behind. And, you yeah. know, you constantly hear about people on Apple devices who are five, six generations back now really struggling. Yeah, to... I, mean, I mean, any phone now, you're five, six years gone, you're going to be yeah. struggling. But yeah, Windows Phone was, yes, yeah, great for budget smartphones. Mm -hmm. It was really lightweight. Two, also, Super intuitive and user friendly for those who weren't tech savvy. Sure. Big, clear tiles on your, as your home screen. For those maybe of the older generation or those who are less tech savvy, actually it was much easier to use. Yeah. Um, Android and iOS were still a little bit confusing as, as we've moved to gesture controls. As you say, the, our generation and those younger than us are fine with all of that. Yeah. It's not necessarily a natural interaction for those of older generation. Mm -hmm. So Windows Phone filled a relative niche but as I say, it was crippled by apps. But you think Microsoft, surely that can compete. It can push it through and it exactly. tried to reinvent it with Windows 10, yeah. phone edition. Which shut up shop, what, a couple of days ago now as of filming this? A week yeah. ago, something like that? So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a shame because you know having that choice in the market is excellent, but Windows, it was the apps that killed it. And yeah. talking about apps that killed stuff, BlackBerry 10, BB10, BBOS10, BBOS10? BlackBerry 10. <laughs> I mean, it's that long ago, I can't even remember. I'm exactly. Long, but at the time, it was like, okay, BlackBerry needs to kick itself yep. into the smartphone genre. It killed it with the bold and the curve. You know, everyone was on BBM. Yep. Everyone had a bold or a curve. They were the phone to have. Sports stars had them. They relied on the security of BlackBerry Mobile. Yep. And, and again, you go, okay, BlackBerry was on the brink. Yeah. It came out and you're like, this is make or break for BlackBerry. It was their, 100%. It was their roll of the dice. What's going to happen? And you're like, okay, maybe, maybe it can get back to people who love their curve and their bold. But by that time, people, it was two, three years too late. People had already migrated to iPhone and Android and were enjoying that experience and had a wealth of apps at them. Yeah. BlackBerry 10 comes along and it's sort of, oh, you know, we're business savvy, but we also can do a fun side. But again, it lacked the apps, it just didn't have the apps. And if, if you used to your Android or your iPhone and you've got all your apps there and then you're looking at this BlackBerry and half the apps you use aren't available yeah, or are like an older version, then 
I can understand why you wouldn't maybe want to think. And yeah. we did a lot in the next two years after it launched about educating developers, making it as easy as possible to port over apps, but it was all too little, too late for them. And sort of with Microsoft as well, just playing catch up. And again, what happened? It died and now Blackberries run Android, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. A little poor one out for all those iOSs that tried their yeah. bloody hardest. And do you think there's any chance now of somebody coming out in the next decade to challenge Android and iOS? I can't, personally, I can't imagine it. Like it's taken on two absolute giants at this point. Like you say, the apps are there and they have such an install base that- Well, it's, it's interesting, difficult. especially with 2019, the year where the US and China fell out, which massively sure. hampered Huawei. Um, who are now working on their own mobile operating system, right. which, you know, if you're in the US or the UK, no big work. You know, we have plenty of choice, we have plenty of devices running yeah. Android from manufacturers. What you need to realize is Huawei is now the second largest shipper of smartphones in yeah. the world. Mm -hmm. It has a huge user base. So if it suddenly stops migrating people, predominantly starting in Asia, over to its own operating system, then it could gain scale quite quickly. Yeah. And in the Asia market, especially uh, app developers in that region, you know, it, it scale is business. Yes. Scale is money, and they and developers will move towards that. Mm -hmm. So if suddenly it can roll that out, and it won't be easy, it won't be easy to convert people. But if it's going to win anyway, it'll be China first, and then yeah. out from there. Samsung has its Tizen software, which it runs on its smartwatches. Um, Tizen was originally developed as sort of a smartphone platform as well. Yes. So, you know. Theoretically, Samsung could, could launch the sure. biggest shipper of phones in the world. So suddenly, if those two companies decide, actually, we want to go all in, take all the profit for ourselves, have 100% control, yeah. a la Apple, they could feasibly do that. I mean, Android is so ingrained in our lives and yeah, our internet of things, smart devices, smart lens now, it's very difficult to see that happening. Yes. I think it would take a new type of device, a new communication tool to bring a new operating system. So, you know, at some point we will move away from smartphones. Sure. And when that shift happens to whatever that next device will be, be it a smart glass or be it yeah. a contact lens or be it something completely we've not even thought of yet because it's not been invented. I think that's when we see the shift to new OSs. Yeah, that'd be really interesting. That'd be really interesting. So, so my next pick is video game streaming. You know, we started off the decade, Netflix just becoming sort of a ubiquitous thing, streaming video. Surely in 10 years time, we'll be able to stream games as well. Like there's nothing more frustrating than getting home after work, wanting to sit down and play Destiny and realizing you've got a 30 gigabyte patch that you've got to sit through for the next hour. It's insane. We shouldn't be at this point anymore. We should be just streaming our games a la Netflix. And you know, there were companies out there that were trying it. On Live came out first, they said they could do it all. Turns out they couldn't, like it was just a terrible service, terrible games, terrible support, just didn't work. PlayStation Now tried it for a while on the PS3 and then the PS4. And then we had Stadia launch just a couple of weeks ago and nobody's talking about Stadia anymore. It just hasn't taken off in the way we all hoped it would. The game support isn't there, the developers aren't there. So yeah, I don't know, it just I seems mean, like it isn't taken off. It, it has kind of been around for a decade. Sure. Only really it feels in 2019 is it actually getting to a point where it can take off. Sure. But and listen, in the next decade, maybe it will. Yeah. Maybe this time in 10 years in ten years' time, the idea of having a, a box that you put discs into will yeah. be completely foreign to us. Crazy. Um, Although the uh, the new Xbox images that we saw... Of course, does, does have the disc drive. Yeah. Still has it because we, you, we are suckers for a physical medium. Yeah. There is something genuinely sort of that connects you to a game to yeah. a purchase if you have that physical thing 100%. in your hand. But we are moving. I mean, apps, we don't get sent in a box and exactly. on our phone. So we are, as a, as a population, moving away from that physical ownership into digital ownership. Xbox One S or Digital Edition is another example of that. Discourse. Exactly. So, and yeah. there are rumors that something cheaper will come out alongside the Xbox Series X. Maybe it will be a discless version as well as you know less powerful and that sort of thing, cheaper, it's easier to get into. It's frustrating that it hasn't been nailed by now. Like yes. You think there's enough out there to just go, right, we know what we're doing. Exactly. And, and you know, Xbox, I think, are getting themselves into a position where they maybe can do that with Game Pass. You know, they have that library there. Game Pass is such an amazing value proposition for people um, that maybe when they've got that install base on the next generation, they will launch something like, like a Netflix streaming style service and we will be there, hopefully, maybe one day 
I don't need it in 4K, I just need it in HD, but like, you know, I just want it instantly. I don't want to have to wait around. Don't compromise. If they can do it, make them do it properly. 4K minimum, 8K optimum. Well, they've said they've said that the uh follow lens. They've said that the Series X has the capability of 8K, whatever that means. I think it probably means eventually you will get 8K Netflix on it. I'm um, not sure our eyes have the capability for 8K. <laughs> it's a very good point. It's a very good point. We certainly don't have big enough wallets to buy 8K <laughs> TVs, do we? So there we go. There we go. So what's your next pick? Yeah, maybe slightly controversially. Oh, hello. VR. Okay. Now, VR, for me, is a real tricky one. I've had some amazing experiences in VR, but yeah. their experiences there are like 10 minutes. Yeah. It's like, that was awesome. I rode a roller coaster. I went deep diving in a submarine and saw stuff under sure. the sea. I played a really fun game. But after 10 minutes, I'm like, that was cool. Mm -hmm. Take the headset off. Thank you very much. The almost insistence that people have VR in their living room and they put a headset on for maybe hours on end to play a game, I just can't see that. For, for me, that feels like 3D TV all over again. You know, people didn't want to sit at home with a pair of smart glasses on. But then you could say the same about the Wii, the Wii Fit balance board, like these things, these peripherals that, you know, you'd think who in their right mind would want to sit there and do that. And yet they took off big time. Now it's very different to wearing something on your face, sure. But, you know, I think the potential is there. And, and like you say, VR is an interesting one. Seems like it's been around most of the decade, I think, right? Um, and yeah, hasn't quite grabbed the mainstream in the way maybe I thought it would, certainly. You know, PlayStation VR has sold well. You know, HTC Vive and all them sorts of things, they keep coming out with new devices. The Oculus Quest is totally wireless and is, is pretty fantastic. I think, again, this is one of those things in the next decade, if we were doing this video again in 10 years time, we'd know that VR maybe has taken off. I don't know, I wanna see it take off. I wanna believe. And then, um, like, you can argue that it has taken off. You know, there are yeah. multiple devices out for multiple companies and mm -hmm. units have been sold, but I've not been sold on sure. the VR experience. Sure. For me, it's not necessarily a success yet. And we've seen throughout this decade, um, mobile phone manufacturers trying to get you to do VR on your phone with a headset. Yeah. And, you know, everyone went crazy and Samsung yeah. gave away a load of free VR headsets, blah, blah, blah. You know, I've still got my Gear VR in a cupboard somewhere at home, sure. gathering dust, because I used it a couple of times and I was like, oh yeah, this is kind of cool. It's on my phone, but yeah. the quality is, if you've used an Oculus or an HTC Vive, you instantly go, well, this is nowhere near as good. Yeah. And thus that suddenly takes you out of the experience a mm -hmm. little bit. The Gear VR only works with a couple of phones. And so instantly, you know, you can't plug in newer phones because yeah. they're too big or they don't have the right connection. So it's just like, oh yeah, this is kind of cool. But after a few goes, you're like, yeah, I'm putting that away now. I have no, there was no desire to really go back yeah, to it. I totally get it. So thanks so much for watching. Let us know in the comments below if we missed anything off this list, bits of tech that you thought were gonna be huge this decade and just didn't quite take off. If you like this video, give it a like, remember to subscribe and head over to techradar.com for all the latest tech news and reviews.